Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're kicking off a new adventure, the Zenko of the DC. All credit for this story goes to the talented author, whose details you can find in the description below. If you want to follow along, there's a link provided. We'll be covering chapters 1 through 4 in this session. And hey, don't forget to show some love by hitting that like button and dropping a comment. Your engagement really helps with the algorithm, and it means a lot to us. Alright, let's dive right into the story. On a dark night in the city of Gotham, nothing really changes. Everyone constantly looks over their shoulders and fear as crime is at an all-time high. Robberies, murder, kidnapping, drive-bys, hijacking, gang wars, and so much more. The Gotham police are up to their necks in solving these crimes. Taking down one criminal results in two more popping up out of nowhere. Things are not helped by some members letting criminals go scot-free due to bribery and blackmail. However, while the criminals may have precautions against law enforcement, they can't set up countermeasures for a certain man who shares a similar purpose with the police but isn't a part of them. This man works in the shadows, ready to pounce without being noticed. The last thing any of his victims sees is his descent towards them, appearing like a black predatory bat, only to wake up later, tied up in front of the police station. Hence, everyone began to call this shadowy vigilante Batman, the Dark Knight of Gotham. For as long as the people could remember, this dark hero has been solving numerous crimes and defeating many villains with powers beyond what any other human could face. Over time, Batman was joined by several other heroes with the same purpose. Robin, Batgirl, and Nightwing, who was formerly the first Robin before passing the mantle to the second and leaving for another city. At this moment, a police radio is passing information to the patrol cars about a regular crime for them to quickly move in and neutralize. All units, please be informed that there has been a robbery at Calico's Jewelry, and the suspects are currently making their escape in a getaway vehicle, a blue 2016 Ford Transit 150 van. One of the policemen picked up the radio and responded to the call, This is 8, Lincoln, 30 to dispatch. We read you loud and clear. We're engaging pursuit of the robbers, over. They drove off in search of the robbers unaware that someone else was tapping into their communications. He was perched on top of a tall tower spire with a wireless headset to his ears. Surprisingly, this person wasn't Batman or any member of the Bat family. He wore a black outfit, a gray flak jacket, a forehead protector with a long black cloth, and black sandals. Over it, he wore a hooded, short-sleeved red coat with a black flame pattern around the hem, and to top it all off, a white porcelain mask resembling a fox with long ears and red tribal markings. Looks like it's time to go to work, the mysterious figure muttered to himself before jumping off the tower spire in a swan dive. As he neared the ground, he stretched out an arm towards a building, and a long golden chain shot out from his palm, pinning to the roof. He swung over to land on a nearby rooftop and ran along it to the end before performing a long jump with a blue aura visible on the soles of his feet, reaching the next roof. He vaulted over vents without losing speed and shot another golden chain at a tower spire rappelling towards it at high speed before shooting over it like a slingshot and descending towards another rooftop, landing with a roll and resuming his run. Elsewhere, the van turned down an alleyway and stopped before a conspicuous garage. The door opened, and several men jumped out, wearing black clothing and black ski masks with smirks visible on their faces as they carried bags of jewelry from the van. This has to be one of our best scores ever, said one of the robbers. You said it, man and we made our getaway fast enough before the police could trace us, said another. And best of all, neither Batman nor his lackeys will find us before we're long gone, said a third. They were about to approach the garage when several knives struck the ground. These were black diamond-shaped daggers with handles wrapped in bandages and small rings attached to the ends. The robbers immediately took out guns and rifles, alert as they looked around for the interloper. Suddenly, they heard someone whistle at them from above, and quickly looked up to see a man in a strange outfit standing on the roof, looking down at them. Batman and his lackeys should be the least of your worries when making getaways, said the man. Who the hell are you? One of the robbers yelled. Oh, my name is none of your illegal business, he replied. Like we care since you're gonna die. Shoot him. All the gang aimed their firearms at him and attacked. The man was riddled with bullets before plummeting to the ground and landing with a crash. The robbers laughed out loud upon seeing him dead. Ha 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 ha, that guy's practically a greenhorn. He should have never taken up the stupid superhero business, said one of them. Suddenly, he felt someone tap his shoulder, and a familiar voice spoke from behind him. On the contrary, you and your friends are lousy shots. He turned around, only for a gloved fist to smash into his face, 
resulting in a broken nose with an audible crunch, launching him a few meters away and knocking him out. The remaining robbers were stunned to see that the person they supposedly shot down was still alive and standing right next to them. What the? How are you still alive? The man shrugged. That's for me to know and for you to figure out in prison. He dashed off as the robbers shot at him rapidly, keeping pace ahead of their range of fire. Bang, 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 click, click, click. He smirked upon hearing that sound before making his way towards them. One of the robbers launched a straight punch, but he caught it in his palm before retaliating with a strong button hook, causing the robber to vomit and collapse to the ground. The masked man heard footsteps from behind and performed a backflip over his attacker before stomping on the head, driving him hard to the ground, knocking him out. His ears picked up the sound of a gun being reloaded, and he quickly reached into his pouch and flung a knife at his target. Ark! The last robber cried out in pain as the knife stabbed his hand, forcing him to drop his rifle. The next thing he knew, a golden chain wrapped around his waist and pulled him towards the masked figure, who had a fist reared back, ready to strike. Going up, the man lashed out with a devastating uppercut, launching the robber a couple of feet into the air with the chain still attached. Coming down. Then he grabbed the chain and pulled hard, slamming the robber into the ground. The masked figure looked around to see the criminals all knocked out and nodded in approval of the scene. Now here's the annoying part, cleaning up after them. About 20 minutes later, a fleet of police cars arrived at the area to find the robbers all tied up together with what appeared to be metallic wires and the bags of jewelry inside the van. Hey, I found something here. It looks like a note, said a policeman, holding up a piece of paper. The captain approached the note and read it out loud. Here are the guys you were looking for. Things would have gone better for them if they had simply studied hard at school and gotten a decent job, don't you think? Your friendly neighborhood ninja, Zenko. Several policemen chuckled in amusement, while others remained serious. That Zenko fellow again, huh? Just who the heck is he? Is he friends with Batman? Asked one of the policemen. I don't know. Commissioner Gordon was informed by Batman that he has no affiliation with Zenko. All we could get from the prisoners was that he fights like a ninja and seems to use golden chains. All in all, we'll need to bring him in for questioning to find out exactly who he is and what he wants. Yes, sir. Somewhere on top of a building, the masked figure could be seen sitting on a ledge and watching over the city, letting out a sigh of boredom. It has been four months since we appeared here after the war, Naruto. A dark voice suddenly spoke up from within the mind of the person who didn't react to it in shock. I know, Kurama. I've searched for many ways to get back to our world and found nothing at all. The man pulled down his hood to reveal blonde spiky hair before taking off the mask, revealing a rather handsome face with three whisker-like markings on each cheek, giving him the impression of a fox. We were right at the climax of the war against Madara before Kagaya entered the fray. Sasuke and I had it tough, but we were able to place the seal that the Rakuto Sinin gave to us. But what we didn't take into account was the reaction afterward. The sudden ejection of my brethren's chakra caused some sort of reaction with your father's Hiroshin Kanai, which somehow warped us into this world. That's pretty much the gist of things. This world is strange with how people can live without chakra, but they seem to make up for it with technology that is way beyond our own. Naruto placed his chin on his palms, deep in thought. Let's not forget about the superheroes we've been hearing about. Yeah, guys like Superman, The Flash, Green Lantern, not to mention Batman owning this place in particular. Most of these guys have powers that could have counted as Kekiai Jinkai in our world, and they use them to help people, which is A-OK -okay in my book. Not to mention the supervillains they go up against. Naruto looked thoughtful at that statement. Yeah, but not all of them resort to crime for selfish reasons, unlike some I've met back home. Kurama shrugged his shoulders before relaxing within the seal. So what is your current plan now? Well, I'll need to do some more training with the scrolls that Kasan and Tusin left behind for me to inherit and master not to mention mastering the four fangs of the dragon too. I've been hearing their call for a while, but I was putting them off until now. I've picked the perfect place to train. Japan. Kurama simply deadpanned at this. Your main reason is because of the ramen there. Eek. Details, details. Let's get a move on. Naruto put on his mask and hood before leaping off the building towards his temporary hideout to pack some of his stuff before making his way to the airport to sneak onto a plane for a quick flight to his chosen destination. Meanwhile, Somewhere near the sea is a rather classy mansion situated close to the edge of a cliff. This building belongs to Gotham's renowned billionaire and owner of Wayne Enterprises, Bruce Wayne. The place might seem to be the ideal residence for a man like him, but there's more to this man than meets the eye. 
We venture into the manor and through a hidden passageway that leads into a cave with bats flying around and numerous varieties of technology ranging from automobiles to jet planes. In the center of the cave are computers with many monitors and someone sits before them. The man wears a two-piece gray bodysuit with a bat-shaped emblem sewn on the chest region a black cowl with long pointed earpieces covering his head and half of his face, with only the mouth and chin exposed. The cowl is attached to a black scalloped cape that hangs down below the knees, long black gloves with three pointed accoutrements on each forearm, a yellow square belt with multiple pouches, and black boots reaching up to the knees. This man is none other than Batman, the Guardian of Gotham. He is currently focused on a particular monitor displaying a news channel covering recent events. On the news today, there was a robbery at Calico's Jewelry, and the Gotham police later found the criminals detained with a note written by this mysterious vigilante who goes by the name Zinko, which according to Japanese means good fox. Just who is this man, and what is his reason for such actions? Could he be affiliated with Batman and his partners? Said the newscaster. Batman turned off the monitor and seemed deep in thought until he heard footsteps from behind and looked to see an elderly man with gray hair, wearing a butler's outfit. This Zinko fellow is quite the mystery. Wouldn't you say, Master Bruce? said the butler. Batman took off his cowl, his eyes still on the screen. Maybe so, Alfred, but his battle style is what irks me. His usage of shuriken, kanai, a golden chain, and stealth all linked to the capabilities of a ninja. Sounds just like you, Alfred remarked. True, but most ninjas come from various clans with different ideals. We don't know his purpose here in Gotham, or if he's doing all this as a form of a ruse. I need to find this man to make sure he isn't a threat in disguise. It seems to me that this fellow responds instantly to distress calls from the Gotham police and moves ahead of them to resolve the situation and leave before their arrival, said Alfred. I figured as much, which is why next time, we'll be waiting for him and finally get to the bottom of things, Batman concluded. It was a busy night for Batman and his partners in Gotham City, and he was feeling quite annoyed. It definitely had nothing to do with the recent crimes tonight or the past nights either as he perched on the roof of a tall building after helping the police arrest a group of drug dealers. He heard someone land next to him and turned to see one of his partners, a black-haired teen wearing a black eye mask, a costume with a red torso featuring a yellow, R on his right pectoral, yellow stitching, a utility belt, black boots, short sleeves and gloves, and a cape that was black on the outside and yellow on the inside. Did you get any clues, Robin? asked Batman. Not even a hint. I'm telling you. It's like this Zenko fellow just disappeared from the grid said Robin. That's certainly strange. In past events, Zenko often appeared during criminal activities and left after detaining the criminals. What could have changed his pattern and stopped him from resolving crimes? Batman wondered. Robin looked at Batman curiously. But what's the big deal about this Zenko guy? From what I'm seeing, he's rather helping us out by taking down bad guys. Maybe so, but Zenko has the training and mannerisms of a ninja. One of the greatest tools of a ninja is deception something we need to find out if he is using. We need to determine where exactly he came from to figure out which clan he originates from, Batman explained. So a wild card, in other words, said Robin. Well, wild card or not, you guys won't be able to find him, a feminine voice spoke up, causing Batman and Robin to turn towards it. The voice belonged to a girl with long auburn hair, wearing a black bodysuit with a cowl similar to Batman's, yellow gloves, boots, and belt with the bat emblem on her chest in yellow. Her short cape was black on the outside and yellow on the inside. What do you mean by that, Batgirl? asked Robin, confused. Aside from his absence here in Gotham, I was watching a documentary on a Japanese channel as a reference for my school project when it suddenly switched to breaking news about an ongoing war between two Yakuza clans in a district. I was about to shrug it off when I saw that Zinko guy show up on TV and take down both clans. So I suited up and came over to tell you guys about this, said Batgirl. That explains why he wasn't responding to the crimes back then, said Batman. Yeah, he wasn't around to begin with. We waited around for a week, and she finds out from watching an international TV channel because of a school project, Robin grumbled. Batgirl smirked in return. Goes to show how far education can take you, something you always complained about. Robin chose not to say anything to prove her point. So what happens now, Batman? For now, we continue with what we do but keep tabs on his activities over there. Though I get the feeling he won't stay there for long and might move to different cities at certain intervals, said Batman. So there's a chance he might meet guys like Superman and the Flash during this tour of his? Asked Robin. Chances are quite large with that question, along with his return. So we'll be on standby until then, said Batman. Personally, he could always contact Superman since they're friends in a way, 
Should the mysterious ninja encounter the Man of Steel? Robin and Batgirl nodded in affirmation before taking out their grappling hooks and firing them at nearby buildings, then swinging off to patrol the city, leaving Batman to his thoughts about the mysterious vigilante. Meanwhile, we find the said ninja at the beach over at the Ogasawara Islands, wearing a pair of orange swimming trunks and blue sunglasses while relaxing on a beach chair with an umbrella overhead to provide shade and a glass of cocktail in hand, with a radio nearby playing some music. Ooh yeah, I can't tell you that one doesn't get a chance to relax like this back at home, said Naruto before taking a sip from his drink. He heard a scoff and pushed up his glasses to glance to the side and see who scoffed. It was his partner, Kurama, who was out of the seal with Naruto, about the size of a regular fox. He was currently curled up on a beach blanket, taking a snooze when he heard Naruto talk. Oh, please, the only time you relax is when you go to the hot springs. Otherwise, you would be training your head off because of the Uchiha or the Akatsuki, which is why I'm wondering why you aren't training now, said Kurama. Relax, Kurama. I am training. My clones are currently at the cavern reading the scrolls. When they dispel and transfer the knowledge to me, I'll create more clones to practice the techniques memorized, Naruto explained. And what about the four fangs of the dragon? Aren't your clones going to practice with them as well? According to the letter which Ka-san left for me, these weapons are sentient and demand respect. Should I use my clones, they will reject me and permanently forbid me from wielding them, so I won't take that risk. If you say so, I suggest you hurry up so we can leave and see other places. I get the feeling we might be missing out on something interesting if we stay here any longer, said Kurama. Naruto couldn't blame him. Kurama likes to relax from time to time, but that doesn't mean he wouldn't be spoiling for a fight every now and then. Naruto had just finished drinking the cocktail when he felt the memories of the shadow clones he had ordered to read the scrolls flow into his mind. He reached under the beach chair and pulled out a scroll, which he unrolled and channeled Chakra into one of the seals to release his black and orange tracksuit and ninja sandals. Kurama popped an eye open to see his partner dressing and figured out what was going on. Finally going to train, asked Kurama. Yup, so no need to wait up for me. I might take a while, Naruto said, walking off towards the area marked for his training, out of prying eyes. He arrived at a nearby clearing in the forest where he saw the last of the shadow clones, waiting with two scrolls in hand. The clone handed over the scroll and nodded before disappearing in a puff of smoke. Naruto unfurled one of the scrolls and channeled Chakra into the seal engraved upon it, unleashing a surge of energy that knocked him back a bit. He got to his feet and approached the scroll to see four weapons levitating before him, each identifiable from his mother's words. First was Inazuma, the three-section staff embroidered with the design of a dragon wrapped around each of the sticks. It was said to be able to command lightning from the heavens. Next was Banrai, a pair of sickles tied together by a short chain which showed that it could be wielded like nunchaku. It was fabled to crush mountains with its thunder. Levitating next to them was Bayako, a spear with two side blades pointing down like an upside-down crescent, known as the hungry ghost who calls the cleaving wind. The last one was Gunshin, an okatana with an intricately designed blade and a purple sword grip, with a small blade jutting out from the bottom of the handle. This weapon was said to command the flame of the Dragon King. These are the four fangs of the dragon. I can sense their powerful aura all the way from here. Naruto recalled the brief history of these weapons from his mother's chakra avatar within the seal. She said that these weapons originated from a mystical hearth of eternal flames called the Spirit Forge, which granted mystical weapons to whomever was worthy but inflicted inexplicable pain on those who were not. Knowing that they possessed a certain level of sentience, Naruto stepped forward and proclaimed, I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, son of Minato Namikaze and Kushina Uzumaki. I am a member of the royal family of the Uzumaki clan. I stand before you today with a request to be your wielder like my ancestors in the past. I swear to you that I shall not wield you as mere tools, but as partners on the battlefield. The four fangs glowed faintly, then floated towards Naruto, swirling around him slowly, almost as if carefully examining him for any signs of deception, which made him feel a bit nervous. After what felt like a minute, the weapons levitated in front of him. Banrai floated up to Naruto, as if beckoning him to hold it. Naruto took the chain sickles into his hands and instantly felt its aura flow throughout his body. He felt its desire for battle and the urge to take down all those who would oppose it and its wielder. Then it converted to red energy and melded with his left arm, leaving behind a tattoo of a red dragon. Next was Inazuma, whose aura told him it was witty at times, but would instantly get serious when the situation called for it. It left an orange dragon tattoo on his right hand. Bayako followed, with an aura depicting its being more technical than purely offensive, 
before leaving a purple dragon tattoo across his shoulder blades. Finally, there was Gunshin, whose aura depicted its seriousness and strong focus on the task at hand. However, the melding from Gunshin was rather painful, making Naruto fall to his knees to endure it. It felt as if hot metal was being pressed on several parts of his body. Eventually, the pain faded, and Naruto got back to his feet, feeling the presence of the weapons and their acceptance of him as their wielder. Thank you, and I promise that I shall never disappoint you all, said Naruto. The orange dragon tattoo glowed brightly before it faded, revealing Naruto holding the three-section staff in hand. He felt memories of what appeared to be his ancestors wielding Inazuma in battle flow into his mind. Naruto formed a shadow clone, who took out a pair of kanai while he held both ends of the staff in a triangular formation. The clone charged forward and started to slash. Naruto used the ends to parry the incoming strikes, then let go with one hand to swipe with the staff like a whip, causing the clone to duck under it and counter with a low sweep kick. Naruto jumped into the air and descended with a vertical lash, with the clone raising both kanai. However, it ended up blocking the middle length, and the other end whacked it in the back leaving it open for Naruto to pull back and grab the end before thrusting both into the clone's chest, dispelling it in a puff of smoke. Naruto was mildly surprised with the staff's capabilities despite the short spar and resolved to learn more of the katas along with the other weapons. A month later, Naruto had reached a high level of proficiency in wielding the fangs, thanks to the times he had sparred with Tintin and her weapons back in Kanoha and his fights with swordsmen during missions out of the village. Though using Banrai required more practice due to having never met anyone wielding a weapon like it before, he eventually got the hang of it without worrying about cutting himself. However, that didn't mean he slacked off on his ninja training either. He made use of his shadow clones to practice jutsus from the scroll in hand, and even practiced alongside them to stay in shape and not be lazy like his old friend Shikamaru. It was during the end of the month that he found something rather interesting. Naruto and Kurama, who hid away eight of his nine tails to ride on Naruto's shoulders, had long since left the Ogasawara Islands and were taking a tour through Japan, all the while detaining criminals. At that moment, they were at Takachiho, viewing a large cave with some tourists from an observation point. It had been told in the legends of the Japanese religion Shinto that the sun goddess Amaterasu hid herself inside in grief after her brother Susano, the storm god, went on a rampage, leaving Japan in complete darkness for a long time until the gods conspired to lure her out of the cave by throwing a party which piqued her curiosity enough to come out. Never thought that this world would also know about Shinto, thought Naruto. The old man once told the bijou and me that some dimensions tend to share similar aspects, and this happens to be one of them, said Kurama. Naruto walked back to the bus station. That's true. Anyway, where is our next destination? How about this place? Akihabara? I hear they sell some pretty cool stuff, so it won't hurt to check it out. He suddenly heard something akin to a chick cheeping. Feeling curious, Naruto strayed off the path and followed the sound, noting that the cheeping became faster and that he felt a sense of panic. This caused him to move quickly until he stopped at a tall tree and looked up to see a large bird attacking the source of the cheeping, much to his anger. Naruto took out a shuriken from a seal on his wrist and threw it to purposely miss but scare the attacker away. Then he quickly climbed to the top and saw a chick with red feathers. It was very hurt. Damn, I can't believe that bird would do something like this. I'm not picking up any scent of its parent. Best use my chakra to heal it, said Kurama. The chick saw the stranger and the fox and started to panic when the human reached out to grab it. It tried to escape, but the injuries were too severe. The human scooped it up in his hands, and it closed its eyes in fear when suddenly a warm sensation came over it and the pain went away. The chick opened its eyes to see a golden flame covering its body before fading away, and the human was smiling. There, all better now. Let's put you back and watch out for that crazy bird. Okay, said Naruto. He placed the red chick back on the branch, but no sooner had he done that than the bird hopped back into his hand, much to his confusion. Ah, uh, I'm done healing you, so just wait here for your parents, okay? He put the bird back, and again it jumped into his hands, this time hopping onto his spiky hair and settling there comfortably. What's going on here? Apparently, this chick sees you as its parent, said Karama. What? But that doesn't make sense, especially since it hatched long ago, Naruto protested. Actually in a way it does, due to there being no scent of the supposed parent, and because you protected it from that bird and healed it, the chick imprinted itself upon you. Naruto wanted to say more but couldn't, just feeling that this was going too fast. So it's stuck with me, huh? Yup, so what are you going to name it? I got nothing. Let's talk about this later, 
okay? Got a lot on my mind. Naruto climbed back down to the ground and walked away. Hmm, it's getting kinda hot. Must be the heat of the sun. Weeks later, Naruto was swinging with his chakra chains and his Zenko gear as he moved through Tokyo at nighttime. He was currently in search of any crimes to deal with before packing up and leaving Japan for his next destination. He let go of a chain to somersault a few times before landing on a roof, then ran along to leap off the edge towards a skyscraper where he ran along the wall and fired a chain at another building to swing off and dive to the streets below. Naruto grabbed onto a street light pole and spun around several times before using the momentum to launch himself into the air and land on a moving commercial bus. He waited briefly before jumping towards an alley and bounding up the walls to the roof, where he leapt along the rooftops and perched on top of a water tower. He was currently scoping out the area when he heard a cheep and something poked out from his hood to appear beside his head. It was the young bird, but it had grown quite a bit with beautiful plumage. Naruto smiled fondly as he rubbed its neck, and it enjoyed it. I see you're relaxing, Sigmas, you lazybones. He chuckled when the bird chirped in protest. Suddenly, he heard gunshots and looked to see a group of men dressed in black tuxedos and wearing black masks engaging the police in a gunfight. And here I thought that I wouldn't find something to do tonight. Prepare for another action-packed episode. Naruto bounced on his toes before jumping off the water tower towards the fight below. The police were taking cover behind their vehicles to avoid the gunfire from the masked gangsters. One of the policemen poked his head over to look and was stunned when one of the gangsters took out a firearm that they weren't supposed to have. Men, run. One of them has an RPG, rocket-propelled grenade, ready to fire at us. The rest of the enforcers scrambled to escape the incoming blast, but the warning came too late as the gangster fired a grenade towards them. The explosive projectile was halfway there when someone landed in front of it, then took out a scroll and unfurled it, calling out seal, and the grenade disappeared in a puff of smoke, much to the shock of both sides. Having a clearer look, they recognized who the person was. It's Zenko. The guy who helped take down those Yakuza from the other city. What's he doing here? Naruto put the scroll away in his pouch and faced the gangsters as he called out to them. Didn't your mothers tell you never to play with guns or RPGs for that matter? They're toys for grown-ups after all. That apparently ticked them off. What did you say? You're dead, pal. They all aimed their guns at him, ready to fire. Naruto simply smirked, and the red dragon tattoo glowed before Banrai appeared in his hands. He took a combat stance. Let's go, Banrai. No sooner did the gangsters start shooting than Naruto twirled the chainsickles like nunchaku around him at high speed, slicing each and every bullet in half as he defended. The police watched him in awe. It wasn't long before the gangsters finally ran out of ammo, leaving them open for Naruto to start his attack. He reached into his pouch and launched a volley of shuriken to knock the firearms away, especially a wind-enhanced shuriken to slice through the RPG that was aiming for him. Naruto leapt into the air and shot out a chakra chain to strike the ground in the middle of the group before pulling himself towards them, nailing two gangsters in the face during his descent. The others brandished katanas and wakazashis to attack. Naruto twirled Banrai once more to deflect the incoming strikes, then countered one with a roundhouse kick, ducked under a slash, and knocked three of them down with a low sweeping kick before performing a handspring kick to strike the gangster coming in from behind. Naruto noticed one of the gangsters running away from the fight and shot out a chakra chain to wrap around his waist. Get back here. He then pulled it back to swing him around and slam him into the three gangsters who had gotten back to their feet, knocking them to the ground again and causing them to lose consciousness. The whole place was silent until Naruto turned to the police after putting away Banrai and cleared his throat rather loudly for them to hear before speaking. Aren't you guys going to do the rest of your job? That seemed to snap the enforcers out of their stupor as they quickly made their way to the defeated gangsters and handcuffed them while returning the stolen money to its rightful owners, with the leader approaching Naruto to speak with him. Thanks for the help, Zenko. If you weren't here, there would have been casualties, said the police officer. Naruto simply waved him off. It's no problem at all. I saw that you guys needed help and provided just that. Even so, thanks, especially for taking down those Yakuza clans back then. Those two were the most powerful in the district until you showed up to take them down. I hope to see you around. Maybe so. Catch ya later. Naruto shot a chakra chain to a nearby building and pulled himself up before swinging away, while many bystanders who had been recording the fight watched him leave. Elsewhere, Naruto was swinging through the buildings and running across the rooftops when he suddenly landed on a rooftop and skidded to a stop with a slight frown behind his mask. Sigmas poked its head from the hood and looked at Naruto as if asking what the matter was, and was gently shushed to be quiet before Naruto spoke out loud. 
You can come out now. I know that you've been following me. He heard footsteps from behind and turned around to see someone appear from behind a large billboard. It was a female with short black hair and her face covered by a red mask, with only her eyes and mouth exposed. She wore a red and yellow outfit with plated armor around the hips, along with black gloves and boots. Naruto took note of the blades strapped to her back, with one of them giving him a chilling sensation. I wonder who this girl is, thought Naruto. I have no clue, but watch out for that sword of hers. I'm sensing some strange energy from it, said Kurama. Naruto mentally nodded in affirmation and faced the mysterious stranger. Who are you? And why were you following me? The woman was silent for a moment before finally replying, I believe that one is supposed to introduce themselves before asking for another's name. Normally, yes. But it's obvious that you know who I am. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been following me. The woman smirked a bit at the response. Very well then, Zenko-san. My name is Katana. I must say that I'm impressed with how you were able to detect me. Only the true masters in the art of stealth could find my presence, which isn't surprising considering that you're a shinobi. Merely standing from this distance, I can feel great power from you. Naruto was mildly surprised at her ability to sense his chakra but responded nonetheless, since he didn't sense any negativity from her. Thanks for the compliment. I can also tell that you're pretty strong yourself with how you hold yourself. But is there another reason why you came looking for me? You're right. I was looking for you to ask why, despite undergoing training as a ninja, you use your skills to help others, to be a hero. Normally, a shinobi is to be loyal to his clan. So why? Naruto was silent for a moment at her question. Why does he help others, especially since this isn't his world, and he should be focusing more on going back home? However, these thoughts were banished no sooner than they appeared, as past experiences reminded him of how far he came from the day of his birth to now. He turned towards Katana and responded to her question. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to become the strongest so that I would be acknowledged by everyone in my village. But that changed a bit when I started meeting people with differing ideals and learned a lot from them, and in turn, taught others. I learned never to abandon my comrades no matter what. That true strength comes from your desire to protect the people close to you. I don't do this just to be a hero, but because I want to help others when they need it. Which is why I'll never give up, never run away or go back on my word. For it's my nindo, my ninja way. Katana was taken aback by this. She could tell from the sound of his voice that the ninja was young, and yet such conviction is very rare to be seen. This is why she asked her next question. If so, then why are you all the way out here instead of being in your village? Katana noticed the ninja let out a sigh of depression before he responded. Due to certain circumstances, I ended up being displaced from my village with no way of returning. But I'm still searching for a way back. But in the meantime, I decided to help the citizens in any way I can till then, said Naruto. I see, then Katana thought. Where would his village be that he couldn't return to so easily? I'd best get going. This is my last night here in Japan, said Naruto. Katana was rather surprised. You're leaving? Why were you even here? Last I heard, you operated mostly in Gotham. I came here to train a bit as well as get some r, &R while helping out here and there. Now that I'm well rested and gotten some training in, it's time for me to get a move on, said Naruto. Where will you be going? asked Katana. Naruto wagged a finger and spoke with a voice laced with amusement. Now, now, I can't go telling you just like that. After all, a ninja is very particular about information, you know? Katana smiled as well. So will I see you again? Now that I can tell you, I'll eventually come back here. All you need to do is keep an ear out on the news to find out where I am. Till then, I'll catch you later. Naruto reached for his mask and lowered it enough to expose his blue eyes, which seemed to sparkle with light, and winked at Katana before putting it back on, then taking a running leap off the rooftop while shooting out a chakra chain and swinging away, with Katana watching him leave. He's an interesting one. Most ninjas kill their emotions to avoid complications in their missions, but he wears his emotions on his sleeves. I look forward to meeting him again and maybe engaging in a spar, said Katana with a smile. Several hours later, a plane had taken off from the airport and was en route to its marked destination. Inside the cargo hold, Naruto was reclining on some wooden boxes, snacking on potato chips, with Sigmas pecking at some too. Due to technically not existing, he planned to forge some records for himself to get around more easily. Gotham would leave behind a paper trail, especially with someone like Batman capable of tracing him. This is why where he was going might make things a little easier for him to forge. Naruto took out a magazine from nearby and opened it up to read. One of the titles on the cover was Metropolis. Ladies and gentlemen, 
We are now arriving at Metropolis. Please remain in your seats with seatbelts on until the plane lands and comes to a complete stop. Thank you for flying with us and have a nice day, said the air hostess, addressing the passengers on board the Metro airline as it flew towards its marked destination. A couple of minutes later, the plane landed on the runway and taxied over to the terminal. There, the passengers disembarked the aircraft while the workers proceeded to move the luggage, unaware of a blur zipping past them and into the terminal. The blur revealed to be Naruto, who had snuck into the aircraft back in Japan with his pet bird Sigmas tucked into his hood. That was a long flight. Now to change into something so I can blend into the crowd for now. Naruto took out a scroll and unfurled it to unseal some casual clothes. A brown jacket over a white t-shirt, brown trousers, and black boots. He then used a hinge to change his spiky blonde hair to smooth crimson hair, and Sigmas tucked itself into his collar. He calmly walked out of the washroom and left through the arrivals hall. Naruto let out a low whistle upon seeing the city of Metropolis and its tall buildings. Man, check these out. Gotta provide some awesome views from up top. That's nice and all, Kit, but remember why we came here instead of going straight back to Gotham, said Kurama. I know, I know. Good thing I studied the map a bit on the way here, thought Naruto. He hailed a cab to give him a ride into the city, dropped off near the park, and took out the guidebook from his pocket to look at the map once more to pick out his next destination, which happened to be somewhere in Chinatown. Naruto made his way over there. Naruto walked along the streets and looked around the area, resisting the urge to go into ramen shops. His eyes set upon an internet cafe down an alleyway and smirked before entering it. He walked over to the reception desk and whispered to the person behind. Hey man, I was told that you could help me with something, said Naruto. The receptionist looked up with a quirked eyebrow. And what exactly do you need help with? Just a couple of papers and IDs which would help me get a footing around here, and I got some green which I'm willing to hand out for the favor. Naruto rubbed the tips of his thumb and forefinger together, getting the man to narrow his eyes at what exactly he meant as he looked around to make sure that no one was eavesdropping on their conversation. The man got up from his seat and whispered to Naruto, follow me to the back, and we'll get started. Naruto nodded in affirmation and walked after him to the staff room out back. There, the man took Naruto's picture, then inputted some information like his birth certificate, national identity, and other papers before hacking into the database and placing them there. The man finally created the hard copy and cards before putting them into a dossier, which he handed over to Naruto, who then handed the money over to him as payment. Naruto had used a hinge of Kakashi to earn some bounty by catching criminals on the most wanted list. Here you go, man. But remember, we never knew each other, said the man. I won't tell a soul, said Naruto as he walked away back into the streets, where he took out the guidebook again to read. Now that is over and dealt with, our next step would be to find a way to gain a stipend. Why not republish your godfather's books, said Kurama. Good idea. Might as well use their perversions to my advantage, then as well as give a book the attention that it truly deserves, thought Naruto with a smile. He chartered another taxi and had it transport him to a publishing house. He spoke to the receptionist and requested an appointment with the one in charge, then was told to wait for a while. It took at least an hour, with him purchasing a drink from a nearby vending machine to quench his thirst, until the receptionist called out for him to be led to the office of the man in charge. Once passing through the door, Naruto saw a man sitting behind a writing desk with a computer on top of it. The director looked up with a stern disposition. So how may I help you? asked the director. Good afternoon, sir. I'm actually wanting to republish some books made by my late godfather. I have a collection of them right here, said Naruto before reaching into a pocket and took out a book with an orange cover which depicts an image of a man chasing after a woman, both laughing. The director quirked an eyebrow and took the book then proceeded to read. It wasn't long that Naruto heard a perverted giggle, which caused him to roll his eyes. Why does some of the people he encounters tend to be a certain variety of a pervert? A super pervert, a closet pervert, and just plain pervert? What else is there? The director closed the book with a pink tinge on his cheeks as he faced Naruto. Your godfather must have been truly inspired to create such grand art of literature. I'll send it to the boys downstairs to begin the press. I'll be sure to inform you through either email or phone. It will be a pleasure working with you. He stood up from his seat and stretched a hand out to Naruto, who accepted it with a smile on his face. The feeling is mutual, sir, said Naruto. After exchanging a few more pleasantries, he left the office and was soon standing in front of the building with a look of satisfaction. Glad that's over and done with. So what will you be doing next? asked Kurama. I'll send a shadow clone to rent a room for our stay here, while I go on a real exploration of this place. If we're lucky, we might run into Superman along the way, thought Naruto. 
With your devil's luck, it's possible, remarked Kurama. Naruto walked into a nearby alley that he found to be dark enough for cover. Then he created a shadow clone to handle renting a room. He took out a scroll and unsealed his ninja gear, quickly putting it on and undoing the hinge on his hair. Naruto swiftly ran up the side of a building with chakra emitting from the soles of his sandals, latching on and flipping over to land on top. He dashed forward, leapt off the edge, and shot a chakra chain to latch onto a nearby building, swinging over to land on another as he vaulted over an air vent and pushed against it to launch himself high into the air, then landed on the railings to grind along before leaping off the edge for a free fall. He drew close to the ground, launching another chakra chain while using the momentum to increase his swinging speed then launched himself high into the air while performing a few flips and sending out another chain to swing again. Down below on the streets, many pedestrians caught glimpses of the shinobi, swinging along the buildings, and were raising quite a chatter. Look, it's that Zenko guy, exclaimed a man. You mean that new hero we've been hearing of on TV? What's he doing here? asked another. I heard that he was in Gotham, then in Japan stopping a gang war. He must be traveling through the countries. Think he'll run into Superman? Who knows? Elsewhere, Naruto was running along the side of a skyscraper when he jumped off to land on top of a building with a tuck and roll, then using the momentum to leap high to grab onto a vertical pole and spin around a few times before letting go to launch himself into the air. He was in midair when he caught a whiff of smoke followed by the sounds of sirens. Naruto landed on a rooftop and traced the scent and sounds to a burning building, where the fire department was on the scene, attempting to put out the flames before going in to rescue the victims inside. Time to lend them a hand. Or a hundred in my terms, said Naruto. He jumped off the edge and fired a chain to swing low a couple of times before landing on the streets, where spectators stared at him wide-eyed. Naruto turned towards one of the firemen and offered his assistance. I'm here to help you guys out with the fire outbreak, but I might have to borrow your water though. Naruto crossed his fingers to create a group of shadow clones who positioned themselves at the water hoses and fire hydrant nearby. Naruto then weaved through a series of hand signs and activated his jutsu causing large volumes of water to burst from the hydrant and water hose, forming multiple large, spiraling streams of water that shot towards the flames to extinguish them. Thanks for the help, Zenko, but there are people still in there, said one of the firemen. I'm going in to get them out. Naruto ran into the building. Inside, he created several more shadow clones as they took off in multiple directions to rescue the trapped individuals. Naruto was traversing through the burning building when his sensor ability, picked out two traces of negative chakra just a few doors ahead of him. He kicked down the door to find a black-haired woman and her daughter cowering in a corner. Please help us, pleaded the woman. Don't worry, I'm gonna get you two out of here. Naruto was approaching them when he heard a hissing sound from his left. He turned to see a gas cylinder leaking and rushed towards the woman and her daughter, covering them with his cloak while preparing to activate his chakra mode. However, he was too late, and the cylinder ignited into flames. He covered them while bracing for the flames, but he didn't feel any heat envelop them. Instead, he heard a melodious cry and looked back to see a large bird engulfed in flames hovering in the air. Wow, what a pretty bird, said the little girl in wonder. Sigmiz, is that you? asked Naruto in shock. The flaming avian let out another cry as if to confirm his question, absorbing the flames into its wings. Naruto realized that Sigmiz had transformed into a phoenix. Kit, we don't have time to be distracted. Your clones are done with the rescue. And you're the only ones left inside, said Kurama. Right? Naruto created a shadow clone to pick up the girl while he carried the woman. Both jumped through the window and ran down the side of the building as the remaining clones completely extinguished the remainder of the flames. Naruto looked around for Sigmas and found it back in its smaller form, sleeping in his hood. A group of people covered in soot approached Naruto with looks of gratitude. Thank you for... Saving us, Zinko. We're truly grateful for your help, said a man. You really helped us out with this one, said one of the firemen. Thank you and the firebird for saving me and mommy, said the little girl cutely. Naruto simply nodded in affirmation. You're all welcome. I was glad to help. I'll see you all later. He jumped into the air, and a golden chakra chain shot from his palm to hit a building before swinging away, with onlookers watching with admiration. The ninja swung around a few buildings before landing on a rooftop, where he perched on top of a water tower and gently reached into his hood, then held out Sigmas in his cupped hands. I never would have thought that you would be a bona fide phoenix, but it somehow makes sense now. I recall the number of times when the bird would act excited whenever you practiced your fire jutsu and would try to get close to the flames, said Kurama. You're right, 
And it also explains why Sigmiz was alone when we found him back in Japan, thought Naruto. Yeah, heads up kid, there's someone approaching us. At his words, Naruto picked up a trace of foreign energy heading towards them and turned to see who it was before recognizing the person due to the media. He was looking at a teenage girl with long blonde hair, wearing a white short-sleeved shirt with a red S emblem which has the midriff exposed and a red mantle reaching her waist, white gloves, blue short skirt, and red boots reaching up to her shins. Hey, I know you. You're that new hero Zenko, said the girl as she hovered in the air before him. And you must be Supergirl. It's nice to meet you, said Naruto with a slight bow. You're a ninja, right? How come you're operating in the daytime? I thought ninjas prefer acting in the dark, said Supergirl, confused. That's stereotyping. Where I'm from, ninjas can operate both at nighttime and daytime, Naruto replied with a quirked eyebrow. So, what brings you here? Last I heard, you were in Japan. You're on some kind of tour or something, inquired Supergirl. Pretty much. I was doing some training before deciding to take some detours along the way, said Naruto. Saw anything interesting before you came here? Supergirl appeared curious about the ninja. From what she knew, ninjas were supposed to be the silent types and very secretive, but this one seemed to function out of the norm. Her friend Batgirl often told her of how her mentor Batman lacked a sense of humor and also about how he was looking for Zenko. Well, I've been to the Ogasawara Islands, which is an awesome place to lounge at the beach. Then there's Akihabara, where you can get some awesome stuff like manga, gadgets, among other awesome stuff. I recommend that you check it out on your free days, Naruto suggested. Supergirl smirked in response. I think I will, that is once my cousin can manage on his own. I remember that Superman is your cousin. How's the big guy doing? I've heard of the incident with him and that dark side dude, said Naruto. The young heroine looked down in depression. She knew of what he was talking about. Her older cousin Superman had been brainwashed by the lord of the planet Apocalypse, Darkseid, into thinking that he was his son and leading an assault on Earth. She tried to stop him and was defeated, but he eventually broke free of the mind control and defeated Darkseid. However, there was immense damage to his reputation with the Earth's populace, and the trust was severely damaged. Superman didn't reveal much, but she knew that he had been overworking himself to regain the people's trust again. He's doing fine, but he was really bothered about what happened then, said Supergirl. Naruto nodded his head to her words. I can understand how he feels. I was in a situation similar to his. What's that supposed to mean? What could you have possibly experienced to be the same as my cousin's? Supergirl glared at the ninja, questioning how he could equate his experiences with her cousin's pain of ostracism. Naruto chuckled softly at her question. On the night of my birth, something terrible happened in my village. Since then, they hated me because I reminded them of what happened back then. To them, I wasn't one of their own kind but a monster who took away their loved ones. But instead of responding to their hatred with my own, I chose to seek their acknowledgement by becoming the leader of the village. However, that changed to wanting to protect them. Supergirl was rather skeptical and used her super hearing to listen to his heartbeat, only to be surprised that it was beating normally, which meant that he wasn't lying at all. This made her feel a little guilty at what she had said before. But then how could you forgive them so easily, just like that? The thing was that deep within there was a part of me that truly hated the village, and I met it before. At first, I fought against it, but later on made peace with it, with the assurance that I still trust the village as they are important to me. This gave me the confidence to live up to their eventual trust. So when I heard of what happened with Superman, I knew that he would be in the same situation. But I believed that he would eventually regain their trust through his hard work and offered my support to him. Wanting to know more about the ninja, Supergirl used her x-ray vision, and a tinge of pink appeared on her cheeks when she saw the spiky blonde hair and the whisker marks on his cheeks, not to mention his cerulean blue eyes. She was about to say something else when she heard something, and it seemed like Zenko sensed the same thing as he turned to the same direction sharply. I'm sensing a large surge of electrical energy from here, said Naruto. Supergirl's eyes widened in realization of what he was implying. If it was who she thought it was, I think I know exactly who it is she said before flying off. Hey, wait up. How am I gonna catch up with her? Suddenly, Sigmiz jumped out of his hood again and burst into flame, revealing his phoenix form but much larger than at first. Sigmiz screeched a few times and beckoned to its back as if saying to get on, which Naruto caught on to. Thanks for the ride, Sigmiz. Now let's go after her. He leapt onto the phoenix's back and was surprised to see that he wasn't burnt before it flew off at high speed, leaving behind a trail of embers. They soon caught up with Supergirl, who was wide-eyed at the sight. Where did this one come from? 
she asked, confused. This is my first time, actually. Let's get to the source of the surge and stop it as soon as possible, Naruto responded. As the duo drew close, they saw arcs of electricity bursting outwardly and numerous vehicles exploding with the citizens and police officers taking cover from the currently unknown source of the chaos until they finally got a visual. Apparently, it was a girl with ghostly white skin and blue hair which stood on end. She wore a black leotard with a lightning bolt down the front and black boots, with electricity emitting from her body. Just as I thought, it's Livewire, said Supergirl with a frown. I take it you know her well, asked Naruto as he jumped from Sigmus back to land on the street next to Supergirl. Too well. A friend of mine and I went up against her, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn, and we were able to take them down. Looks like she got out of prison. Then I hope you don't mind another team up with me? Naruto took a fighting stance, with Supergirl smirking at him. Sure thing. I'm kinda curious to see what you can do anyway. Then you won't be disappointed. The villainess turned around and saw the heroes, one of whom she was familiar with, as she glared at Supergirl. Well, well, well. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes, Supergirl, and you brought along that ninja wannabe whom I heard of on TV? I'd appreciate it if you didn't mouth off about things you don't know about. You walking battery, said Naruto, with a tick mark on his head, while Supergirl snickered at the snarky reply. Livewire frowned at the ninja. What did you call me? Did I stutter? That's it. I'm gonna light you up like a Christmas tree. Sorry, but we're in the middle of April. Electricity surged from Livewire's hands as she thrust them forward to fire off a dual blast towards them. Naruto dashed to the side and flung a handful of shuriken at her, only for them to be deflected when she created a dome of electricity around her. Supergirl flew straight at Livewire with her fist reared, but the villainess transformed herself into a bolt of lightning and flowed into the electric pole to zip along the power lines before punching the ground and forming a large crater. Oh no, you're not going anywhere, Shaki. Naruto aimed with a chakra-coated kunai and threw it ahead to cut the power line, forcing Livewire to emerge. He then crossed the middle and index fingers before calling out, Shadow Clone Jutsu. A small group of copies appeared next to him before charging forwards to engage the target. Livewire was momentarily surprised before firing electric blasts at them, with the clones disappearing, not before making witty replies. Got the wrong one, try again. Your poor choices of target are why you never get a boyfriend. Oh, thanks for charging up the boss's phone. Hey, we know a guy who loves lightning and also funerals too. The villainess was gritting her teeth as her anger towards the ninja grew with each taunt. Shut up and let me zap you already. Suddenly, she felt something wrap around her waist and turned around to see Naruto holding a golden chain in his hand. Big mistake you made here. Electricity emitted from her body, which she expected to flow through the chain and electrify the ninja, only for nothing to happen. Hey, what gives? You're supposed to be zapped. Naruto smirked behind his mask. That would be the case if my chain was made of metal. Then he jerked hard on the chain to pull Livewire before swinging around several times before flinging her into the air and called out, serving up, Supergirl. Overhead, Supergirl came diving in and lashed out with a powerful punch to send Livewire careening to the ground and slamming into a car. How do you like that, Sparky? said Supergirl with a grin. Livewire got out from the busted car and glared at the heroic duo with anger. I'm far from done, Blondie. She ran over to an electric pole and grabbed onto it as electric currents surged and were absorbed into her body. Naruto saw what was going on before unfolding a windmill shuriken and throwing it to cut off the connection to the electricity. However, she had already absorbed a lot of energy, with electricity arcing from her body. Time for some payback. She took aim at both and fired a large blast of lightning towards them. Naruto quickly swung into action as he stood in front of Supergirl with the purple dragon tattoo glowing before the Japanese spear appeared in his hands. Bayako, calling forth the cleaving wind, he twirled the weapon above his head for a purple tornado to swirl around them before swinging it to launch a crescent wave of wind which split the lightning blast in half, much to Livewire's surprise. Then she saw a flicker of movement before noticing four more of those clones closing in from different directions. Na, Ru, too. All four clones performed a simultaneous high kick to send the villainous into the air for the original to come from above with a somersault. Uzumaki, uprising barrage. He lashed out with an uppercut from the butt end of Bayako to send her up higher towards Supergirl to be hammered back into the ground. This time, she wasn't getting back up from the crater formed on the ground, with the electricity surrounding her fizzling out. The duo approached the defeated villainous with Supergirl using her breath to create an ice cocoon from the neck down in order to restrain her 
with the citizens looking on and taking pictures with their phones. I gotta say, you're pretty good, said Supergirl. And you pack one hell of a punch? Reminds me of two women who can dish them out just as well, Naruto replied, thinking of his teammate Sakura and mother figure Tsunade. Thanks for the compliment. So what happens now? I'll be heading back to rest for a while, before moving back to Gotham. It's been a long day for me, said Naruto. Supergirl looked a bit disappointed at hearing that. Oh, so I guess I'll see you later then, huh? Yeah, but I'll be passing through here from time to time so don't think that you'll be seeing the last of me, said Naruto with a wink, though he got confused when she turned away. What he didn't know was that she was using her x-ray vision to look through his mask and saw him wink at her. He heard a screech and saw Sigmiz swooping towards him. He somersaulted in midair to land on the phoenix's back, and together they flew away before the media could approach him. He really has a cute face, but it feels like I'm forgetting about something. Guess it's not that much of a big deal, thought Supergirl before flying away to patrol the rest of the city for any signs of trouble. Two days later, Naruto was back in Gotham City after taking a train from Metropolis. He was currently swinging through the city with Sigmas flying next to him in its smaller phoenix form in the middle of the night. He had taken down a certain thug whom he had extracted information from about where his leader is situated. Hmm, according to the lackey, his boss's base of operations should be right around here. He landed on the roof of a warehouse as he overlooked a harbor before him. He scoped out the area and could see several thugs armed with machine guns patrolling the area, confirming the info acquired. He began planning a way to infiltrate the warehouse they were guarding. Sigmiz, I need you back in the hood because your flames might attract attention. The phoenix chirped before shrinking and jumping into the hood as told. He took a running leap from the roof and landed on the ground before quickly dashing for some cover behind several stacks of wooden crates. He slightly poked his head out to see a thug walking by. He shot out a chakra chain to wrap around his target before sharply pulling him over and dealing a haymaker punch to knock him unconscious, then restraining him with ninja wire. He climbed up to the rooftop of the warehouse and created several shadow clones to take out the rest of the sentries. He approached the skylight and saw more thugs, with some operating forklifts to move crates full of weapons. He took note of one standing in the center and supervising them. He was a man with short black hair, and half of his face and hair were hideously scarred. He wore a suit with one half white and the other black, with the same going for his tie, and he was constantly flipping a coin. So that's Two-Face, Naruto murmured. He certainly has half a face that only a mother would love, said Kurama. Naruto rolled his eyes at the fox's pawn. He quietly opened the window and crept inside, moving along the rafters overhead before listening to the conversation below. Hurry it up, boys. We need to get these weapon caches to the ship for some serious payday from the dealers soon to arrive, said Two-Face. You got it, boss, one of the thugs replied as he drove a forklift. Naruto's eyes narrowed upon hearing this, and he created a shadow clone before having it disappear to inform his clones outside of what is happening. He took out a single shuriken and flung it to puncture one of the forklift's tires, much to the driver's confusion. He got down to check on the tire and saw something sticking out. He pulled it out to see what appeared to be some sort of metallic star. The thug was about to speak up when he got blindsided with two feet to the face and was out for the count. The sudden noise caught everyone's attention as they turned towards the newcomer and immediately recognized who it was. Oh snap, it's Zenko, said one of the thugs. But I thought he was in Metropolis, said another. Two-Face then spoke up. Like it matters, kill him and let's resume our business. The thugs armed themselves with firearms and took aim at the ninja. Sorry, but not only am I not going to die, but I'll also be shutting down your operation. Naruto sharply threw a handful of shuriken to disarm them before taking evasive action from the gunfire. He vaulted over stacks of wooden crates and ran along conveyor belts, proceeding to weave through a set of hand signs. Wind style. Great wind blast. He thrust his palms forward to produce a large blast of non-lethal wind, sending most of the thugs flying into walls and craters, knocking them out. Arg, just shoot him already. Two-Face yelled in anger. We're trying boss, but we can't seem to keep a beat on him, said a thug right before a chakra chain wrapped around the arm holding the gun and was swung around to slam into one of his cohorts. Naruto would have smirked, but he had to leap high into the air to avoid gunfire from behind and threw two kanai to disarm his attackers before descending towards them with a double punch to knock them out. He turned around to face an annoyed Two-Face flipping a coin. Now it's just you and me, buddy. True. Then in that case, let's play a game of chance, said Two-Face. Naruto quirked an eyebrow at that. A game? Of course. If I win, then you let me go. But if you win, then I'll come in silently, 
Two-Face knew that he couldn't beat Zenko head-on and so resorted to another option, which is to gamble his way out. Naruto thought deeply about this before giving his answer. Sure, I agree to your terms. Two-Face smirked at this and flipped the coin high into the air before catching it and slapping it on the back of his other hand. All right, call it heads or tails. Tails. Two-Face opened his palm, and his eyes widened at what the coin was revealing to him. Naruto took note of the criminal silence and spoke up for him to hear. I guess I win, huh? If it's any consolation, I've never lost a gamble with my devil's luck, said Naruto with a smirk. Two-Face turned around to run when he felt a chain wrap around his waist, and he was suddenly pulled towards the ninja who had a fist reared back before slamming it into his face, knocking him to the ground unconscious. I was aiming for the good side of your face, even though you're all bad. Heh, good one, said Kurama. Thanks. After tying up Two-Face and the other thugs in Ninja Wire, Naruto and his shadow clones waited until the weapons dealers arrived. They pounced on them as well before making an anonymous call to the Gotham police on his phone. He waited until hearing the sounds of sirens before taking his leave and swinging away from the harbor back into the city. He leapt from one building to another when he skidded to a stop on top of an apartment, and Sigmas perched on his shoulder before calling out. You can come out now. I know that you've been following me for a while now, said Naruto. A black silhouette appeared from the shadows and stepped into the moonlight as the ninja turned around to see that it was none other than the Dark Knight of Gotham. I never thought that I would meet you, Batman. And I was searching for you, Zenko, said Batman stoically. For what reason? asked Naruto, confused. To inquire about your purpose here in Gotham. What is that supposed to mean? I've been helping out with the police wherever I go, whether it is here in Gotham or any other city which I've been to. Naruto was getting a little annoyed at the question. I am well aware of your participation in stopping the gang war in Japan and your recent assistance to Supergirl against Livewire, with skills similar to that of a ninja, said Batman. From the way he speaks and how he operates, this human must have had interactions with Shinobi in the past, said Kurama, with Naruto nodding in agreement. So what is it that you want with me? asked Naruto. To make sure that you're not a potential threat in disguise. So I'll have you come with me to learn who you are and about your ninja clan, said Batman. Naruto frowned at this. I can't let you do that. You, of all people, know how one's background is to be kept secret to protect oneself as a shinobi. Besides, my clan is almost non-existent. You wouldn't be able to find them anyway. One is to judge by actions, not always by background. So you'll just have to keep observing me like you did earlier. Batman's eyes narrowed behind the mask. He had positioned himself far from the harbor to observe the ninja, and he never would have thought that he would still be detected. He was unaware that Naruto always leaves shadow clones around to keep an eye out for surrounding areas, and one of them had located Batman then dispersed to inform him. He saw Naruto walking away, then reached into his utility belt and threw a pair of bola at the shinobi as it wrapped around its target. However, the ninja was engulfed in white smoke before dissipating to reveal a wooden log with a note attached to it. Batman cautiously approached the note and read it. You really need to work on your trust issues and quit being a brooding emo. The Dark Knight's eye twitched in annoyance from what he read. However, seeing this only adds more to the skill list which he has so far observed from the shinobi. Somewhere else, on top of a clock tower, Naruto was currently standing on one of the tower spires with Sigmas tucked in behind his hood. He was smiling mischievously at the note that he left behind. His playful ways are still with him. I gotta say, He's one shrewd person. Don't you think, Kurama? Thought Naruto. You're telling me, he has about as much emotion as a frozen fish. Even the damn Uchiha has about just as much expression, said Kurama. Well, he really needs to learn how to trust others. If he could gain partners. Anyways, let's patrol for one more crime than call it a night. Naruto jumped from the spire to the ground below before shooting out a chakra chain and swinging away as he jumps across buildings in search of the next crime to help the Gotham police resolve. It was another night in Gotham City, and Naruto could be found inside a Chinese restaurant called the White Koi while dressed in civilian clothing. He was currently eating a bowl of chicken fried rice and mango pudding for dessert while conspicuously slipping several grains of rice into the breast pocket of his trench coat for Sigmas to pop out and eat some of them. They were enjoying their meal when they heard the sounds of sirens, and several squad cars zoomed by the window of the restaurant, much to their confusion. Naruto quietly took out his headset, and tapped into the police frequency to find out what's going on that the police would require trained squads. All units report to the harbor. Killer Croc is on a rampage. Lethal force is required to subdue the suspect. The message came through. The blonde quirked an eyebrow at that, but he placed his money on the table to pay for the food before leaving the restaurant. 
He quickly walked into a nearby alleyway, then used a smoke bomb to serve as cover while quickly changing into his battle gear. Naruto ran up the side of the building to the top with Sigmiz in its phoenix form following after him. He leapt off the roof and onto Sigmiz, who had increased its size. We need to get to the harbor and fast, said Naruto. Sigmiz screeched in response before taking off at high speed, leaving behind a trail of fire. It didn't take them long before they arrived at the harbor where they saw many parts of the harbor destroyed. Wrecked vehicles were on fire, and the members of the squad were taking cover from the source of the destruction. He is a hulky male with green scaly skin and sharp teeth similar to that of a crocodile with clawed hands and feet which are bare. He also a pair of tattered trouser with a worn brown belt to hold it up. As of now, the mutant lifted a forklift then flung it at where the enforcers were taking cover. Suddenly a golden chain appeared to wrap around the airborne vehicle and jerked it to the side, altering its original trajectory to miss the enforcers. There was a loud screech as a flaming bird swooped to the ground, and someone jumped off its back to land before the mutant. So you must be that new hero whom I've heard of, Zenko, said the mutant. And I've heard of you, Killer Croc. You kinda remind me of another guy, except he's themed after a shark, said Naruto. So, you think you have what it takes to defeat me? Killer Croc taunted the ninja. Naruto cracked his knuckles, then took a fighting stance. Only one way to find out, don't you think so too? Killer Croc let out a bestial roar and charged at Naruto, swiping at him with his claws. Naruto ducked under the swipe, then backflipped to evade the follow-up. He dashed forward and lashed out with a punch at his opponent's torso, which didn't seem to do much damage. He quickly backed off when the reptilian man tried to take a bite out of him with his teeth. That skin of his must be cushioning physical blows a bit, thought Naruto. Then you just have to hit him harder, said Kurama. Naruto nodded in affirmation and took note that Killer Croc had gone to grab a wooden crate and flung it at him. He stretched a hand out to fire a chakra chain as it wrapped around the crate in midair. Then he spun once before launching it back to slam into the cinder. Growling in anger, Killer Croc grabbed an anchor with a long chain attached, which he twirled overhead, then swung it at his enemy. Naruto darted from left to right, avoiding the wild swings of the anchor. He reached into his ninja pouch to take out a kanai as he channeled wine chakra into it. Naruto ducked under another swing and sliced the chains apart to disarm an annoyed Killer Croc. Come here so I can crunch you to pieces. Killer Croc roared as he dashed towards Naruto. That would be a problem because... Naruto crossed the middle and index fingers of both hands. Then there was a large puff of smoke which faded to reveal several copies standing next to him. Which one do you want to bite? He and his clones charged back to engage the enemy. They darted from side to side to evade the wild swings, though others weren't so lucky and got dispelled from the impact. One clone appeared from behind and fired a chakra chain to wrap around Killer Croc's neck before pulling it hard to hold him back. Two more clones seized the opportunity to move in while weaving through a series of hand signs. Wind style, beast tearing gale palm. A mass amount of wind swirled around their hands and extended from them to form two massive demonic-like claws which they swung to send Killer Croc flying through two warehouses. They didn't wait long, and something bust through the roof and landed near them, revealing Killer Croc looking quite livid. Somebody's mad at me, must be because he sensed that I smiled behind my mask, Naruto taunted. Rhea, you're just as annoying as Batman. Killer Croc raged and lunged at Naruto. I'll take that as a compliment. Naruto waited until the last minute to duck under the grab from Killer Croc, then he channeled Chakra to his right foot, and lashed out with a kick powerful enough to launch him into the air. Naruto created two more clones then quickly leapt into the air after him and positioned himself above. The clones shot two chakra chains to wrap around their opponent's arms and pulled him into the ground as Naruto stretched out his hands and formed two blue spiraling spheres in each. He then dove after him. Rasengan Barrage! He rammed the attack, driving Killer Croc deeper into the ground to form a large crater. The dust cleared to reveal Killer Croc laying there unmoving with two spiraling wounds on his torso. Naruto took out a paralysis tag and stuck it on him. Then he turned towards the audience and called out to them. He's all yours, but be sure to double your locks this time because he might try to break out to find me since I've gotten his attention now. Naruto whistled for Sigmas to swoop down for him to jump on his back and fly away. Naruto and Sigmas are currently flying over the city park when the former suddenly picked up negative emotions below him with his sensor abilities courtesy of Kurama. He looked below to see several thugs ganging up on a red-haired girl dressing in a costume similar to Batman's, but with yellow in addition. He recognized who it is. Yo Sig, I need to swing by and lend a hand. Okay, buddy? 
Sigmus screeched in affirmation before flipping backwards and shot out a chakra chain for the phoenix to grab with its talons. Naruto continued to lengthen the chain as he drew close then lashed out with both feet to slam into the head of a thug, knocking him into another. Everyone turned towards the newcomer and their eyes widened upon recognizing who it is. Yo Batgirl, hope you don't mind if I join in? Said Heroin simply shook her head. I don't mind, there's enough to go around. That's cool. Naruto turned his attention towards a pair of thugs wielding an iron pipe and baseball bat who lunged at him. Talk about one-trick ponies. He evaded a swing from the thug's pipe and responded with an uppercut which popped him into the air. Then he performed a cartwheel to the side to dodge another from the thug with the baseball bat. He then went into a handstand and lashed out with a double kick to the head. Naruto quickly leapt after the airborne thug to grab him then flipped in midair to fling him below at the downed cohort in a heap. Naruto turned to observe Batgirl combat her opponents and was quite impressed with her style. From his point of view, she could be ranked mid chunin Batgirl just punched a thug in the face and twirled to launch a roundhouse kick to knock away another sneaking up from behind. She then heard a click and turned around to see the first thug aiming a gun at her. He was about to pull the trigger when something whizzed through the air and sliced off the muzzle before hitting a nearby tree trunk with a thunk. Both were shocked, but Batgirl was quick to recover and lashed out with a snap kick to the thug's head knocking him out. She took out a pair of handcuffs and linked them to two thugs each while Naruto helped out by using ninja wire to tie up the others. Soon afterwards, they turned to face each other. I guess I should thank you for helping me out with these guys twice. They had been causing trouble for the people every night, said Batgirl. It's no big deal at all. I find it a pleasure to help out a beautiful girl such as yourself. Naruto's eyes widened in shock behind the mask. Wait, did I think that aloud? Smooth kit, like sandpaper said Kurama with a smirk before laughing when Naruto stuttered in response. He thinks I'm beautiful. I don't know how to respond to that. Batgirl was thankful for her mask, being able to cover up her blush. She snapped into attention when she noticed that the ninja was calling out to her. Oh, what were you saying? I was saying that you're much more friendly than Batman. He was really getting on my case about who I am and if I am a threat to anyone, said Naruto with a shrug. Well, you did just show up from out of nowhere and started helping people without cause or reason. That, and Batman isn't really a trusting person, said Batgirl. Believe me, our first encounter told me a lot. But I'm also wondering why you took on this hero business myself? One doesn't need a reason to help, but if anything, my mom and dad had always believed me to be a hero and I want to live up to their expectations, said Naruto with a warm smile in memory of them. That sounds like a nice thing to do. I've been wondering about another thing, but is that a phoenix? Batgirl glanced at the flaming bird perched on the ninja's shoulder and was surprised that the trench coat wasn't burnt from the flames. You're right about that. Sigmas was found during my training over in Japan. My buddy displayed his powers during a fire outbreak at Metropolis, said Naruto with said bird flapping its wings and chirping happily. Well, I better get going. Already had a bout with Killer Croc down at the harbor and could use some R&R. &R. You fought Killer Croc? Batgirl was stupefied at what he just said. Naruto simply shrugged. Yeah. He was giving the cops some trouble so I stepped in to help them out. That plus helping you detain these boneheads who thought school was boring to them. Batgirl giggled at the last comment. Supergirl was right about you. You're different from the others. Naruto tilted his head. You know Supergirl? Yeah. We teamed up some time ago to take on Livewire, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn. Oh, I know the former. I wanted to ask her whether she charges up car batteries for some small change. Ha ha ha. I would pay to see the look on her face when you ask her that. Then I'll put it on my to-do list. I'll see you later. Sigmus flew off of Naruto's shoulders and increased in size before he jumped on and rode away, with Batgirl watching. Kara's right about him. Too bad she got to see his face underneath that mask. I would like to see for myself if those whisker marks she was talking about were real, thought Batgirl. Elsewhere, Naruto and Sigmas had arrived at their situated hideout where the blonde took off his gear and went to take a shower after having reconnected the waterline. He went to bed with Sigmas reverting to its chick form and cuddling up to him, bidding both the young avian and bijou goodnight. Naruto fell into a peaceful sleep while dreaming of Kanoha and his friends. Suddenly, his dream changed to him viewing green-skinned humanoid beings being attacked by unknown creatures, and there was chaos and destruction from his point of view. Naruto shot up from his bed panting with his heart beating quickly and sweat flowing down his forehead, while Sigmas was startled from being woken and chirped in worry. Asterisk huff huff asterisk what the heck was up with that dream? Did you see it too, Kurama? asked Naruto. That I did, and it doesn't originate from any of your memories. 
It came from an outside source, said Karama. You mean someone sent that dream into my head? But for what? From our perspective, it looked like the white beings were attacking the green beings' home and laying siege on them. It must be some sort of warning for us. You mean that someone is trying to warn us that those white guys are coming to this planet? In that case, I don't think I'm the only one getting these dreams then. It's possible that Superman may have also received it as well, given that he's one of the strongest heroes here, said Karama. Naruto let out a yawn. Well, we could return to Metropolis and have a small chat with the guy if he did have it, but for now I'm going back to sleep and I hope I don't get that crazy dream again. Naruto laid back on his bed and was almost asleep when his phone started ringing, much to his annoyance. He picked up the phone and scrolled to see that it was an email, then read the contents before finally going to sleep, not before mumbling something about having something else to do when at Metropolis. The next day, we find Naruto riding on Sigmas as they flew through the skyscrapers of Metropolis. Naruto was currently scrolling through the messages he had received since he woke up in the morning. He looked over to see that they were drawing close to the publishing and had Sigmas dive into an alleyway where he changed into casual clothing before making his way to the building and went inside it. He walked up to the door of the director's office and knocked on it a few times before he heard a voice to enter to which he complied and saw the person in question signing several documents on his desk. The director perked up and smiled upon seeing Naruto enter. Ah, Mr. Naruto, just the man I was waiting for. Yes, sir. I saw your email last night and took the morning train to get here, Naruto replied. I'm glad that you could make it here in good time. I have to say congratulations to you and your godfather because once the novel hit the bookshelves, everyone scrambled for a copy till their none left and began making many numerous requests for another distribution or release of a sequel. My boys in the press are making themselves busy with more copies. The director reached into the cabinet below his desk and took out a white envelope which he held out to Naruto. Here's your first paycheck. Try not to spend it all in one place. Thanks very much, said Naruto with a smile while receiving the envelope then opened it to read the amount written on the check and let out a low mental whistle at what he saw. Goes to show the large number of closet perverts in this place, said Karama. Naruto ignored him and paid attention to the director as he spoke. My boys in the press are making themselves busy with more copies to keep up with the reader's demand. I also intend to introduce the next installment after some time, said the director. Okay, sir, just let me know when it is needed, and then I'll be sure to provide the next one for publishing, said Naruto. Like I said before, it will be a pleasure working with you. The director stood from his seat with a hand extended. Same here. Naruto took the hand and shook it with a smile. Then he left the building and was currently swinging through the city with Sigmiz flying next to him. Now that we're done with that, we should go looking for Superman and have a chat with him about this supposed warning. He swung to the top of a skyscraper and went into a cross-legged position to draw a natural chakra to achieve sage mode. The issue is that due to the area being heavily industrialized, there was a serious lack of nature which, in turn, means the time taken to absorb natural energy will increase, while it would be the opposite if he were to be in an area with a large majority of nature. It took Naruto about five minutes until he was able to activate Sage Mode, then started to scope around for Superman's energy signature and so far he wasn't locating it. Better move around a little to find him, he jumped off the building and took to swinging through the city. After hours of waiting and searching the entire city until nighttime, Naruto came to an annoying conclusion. Superman wasn't in the city, and he has been unintentionally stood up. The ninja sat at the edge of a building eating a cup of ramen while grumbling something about people not being where they're supposed to be at the time, among other things. Even Sigmiz was annoyed about its master having his time being wasted as well. I came all this way, aside from getting paid, to have a talk with Superman about something important, only to wait for this guy to show up from who knows where? Naruto ranted as he finished what's left of the ramen for him to casually toss the empty cup over the edge of the building to fall into the open trash can below. Might as well go and get a room in a ho, huh? He was about to deactivate his sage mode when he picked up a rather familiar energy signature west of his position. I wonder what he's doing here, especially out of his territory, said Karama. Only one way to find out. Sigmas, I need a ride. He leapt onto Sigmas's back and directed it towards where the signature was located as they took off. The duo flew past the city outskirts and over a large pine forest until they came upon a single building with a giant satellite dish surrounded by a mesh fence with a signboard which Naruto read it to be Wayne Tech. Metropolis substation. Naruto noticed that several people were on top of the satellite dish. He saw a trio of scientists facing off against Batman, whom he tracked, and someone else was with him. He's a black-haired man wearing a blue bodysuit with a red and yellow emblem of an S on the chest, a long red cape, and red boots. 
Naruto immediately recognized him to be Metropolis Man of Steel, Superman. There's the guy I was looking for this whole time. But there's something up with those scientists, they don't feel human at all, thought Naruto. Not to mention that the negativity in their emotions is rather strong, said Kurama. Naruto nodded in agreement, then he saw the scientists make a run for it with Batman and Superman pursuing them. Might as well help them out with detaining those guys. They were just about to swoop in when Naruto suddenly clenched his head in pain as the visions from last night assaulted his mind, and apparently, the same could be said for Superman who plummeted to the satellite much to Batman's confusion. One of the scientists took out some sort of device and pushed a button, causing some beeping sound to be heard. Batman quickly went to pick up Superman and jumped off while using his grapple gun to swing away right as the substation began to explode. Naruto was able to recover from the throbbing pain in his head and looked to see the duo get knocked into the air by the explosion. He quickly fired two chakra chains from his palms to wrap around their waist then Sigmas carried them away from the destroyed building before placing them a safe distance and landing on the ground. Not too far from the destroyed building. They saw the scientists stand up with broken bodies which instantly repaired themselves then they walked away with one of them, smirking at the heroes. Naruto wanted to pursue, but he needed to check on both Batman and Superman. Batman narrowed his eyes upon seeing the ninja once again. What are you doing here? Same could be said for you. But if you must know I came to Metropolis to have a talk with Superman about something important when I sensed both of you over here and came to check things out, Naruto replied. Batman was about to question him further when they heard a groan and turned to see Superman sitting up with a hand on his head. What happened? You tell me, said Batman. I don't know. I saw images and they were so intense. And then that's all I remember. Superman looked over Batman's shoulder to see Naruto. And you must be Zenko, I've heard about you, and my cousin told me about how both of you work together to fight Livewire. It's nice to meet you too, Superman, but I actually came to Metropolis today to talk to you about something important, and it concerns those images you saw earlier, said Naruto. Superman raised an eyebrow, while Batman paid rapt attention. You know of them? Yeah, I saw those images in my dreams, and I took some time to figure that there's some kind of warning. So I thought to come over to see if you were receiving the same thing, and I can see that you saw them too. Superman nodded in affirmation to Naruto's statement. Then it might have something to do with those scientists, since they obviously didn't want to leave behind any trace of evidence. Batman spoke up. What do you mean? asked Superman. Over the past few months, I've detected several security breaches on our monitoring network. And no one's taken responsibility? No, but this might lead to something more than I thought. There could be someone or something trying to weaken your security for something vital to its plans, said Naruto. I wish I could stay and look more into this, but I'm expected back at Metropolis, said Superman. Another key to the city? Batman spoke sarcastically. Superman reached into his utility belt and took out a pair of wristwatches which he held out to Batman and Naruto. Here, they're signal watches. Call if you need any help. In that case, Naruto, after taking the watch, then reached into his ninja pouch and took out what appears to be a three-pronged kanai with intricate inked markings on the handle. This is my Hiroshin kanai. If you need me, all you need to do is throw it, and I'll appear instantly. Superman reluctantly took the kanai, having just met the hero before flying away, but Naruto didn't give Batman one as both aren't exactly on friendly terms. The Dark Knight turned to speak to the shinobi, only to find said person and phoenix gone without a trace. He kind of finds it ironic since he does the same thing to Commissioner Gordon and his allies. Naruto was at Gotham City and was perched on the spire of a clock tower as he watched a live stream video of the Metropolis News Channel on his iPhone. Good evening, this is Snapper Car reporting. It's been six months since Senator J. Alan Carter's disarmament plan was ratified. While Superman has been working round the clock to disarm hundreds of deadly warheads, public support has swelled. The screen changed to Superman taking apart the missiles stored within the artillery room then switching to the citizens cheering him on in approval of his actions. Yet some remain skeptical. The screen switched to Snapper Car having an interview with a man wearing a red bodysuit which has a mask with yellow wing ornaments on both sides, lightning bolt designs on the waist and gloves, yellow boots, and the emblem comprising of a lightning bolt over a white disc on the chest. Naruto recognized him to be the Flash with the title of the fastest man alive which kinda makes him have thoughts of challenging the hero to a race with his chakra mode. EY. The big guy's heart is in the right but give me a break. I'm the fastest man alive. The Flash dashed in a red blur to appear behind the reporter to tap him on the shoulder before returning to his previous position. And even I can't be in five places at once. Still, with more missiles being dismantled every day, most of us can rest knowing that Superman is watching over us, said Snapper Carr. 
Naruto ended the streaming with a slight frown on his face. True, those nuclear missiles possess great potential for destruction, but on the other hand, it is the strongest offensive weapon against opposing forces. He could also acknowledge that Superman was pretty powerful judging from his past milestones. But Flash has a good point. The Man of Steel can't possibly shoulder the entire world's burdens all by himself. Naruto's past experiences back in the Elemental Nations and a temporarily resurrected Itachi taught him to rely on others to achieve his goals. Karama, I get the feeling something big is gonna happen, and we're all going to be caught unawares, thought Naruto. He could sense a wave of concern from Bayako as well over the matter. Same here. The brooding man's word about the network being breached and this disarming of the missiles are too closely linked to that dream which we're still receiving every night, said Karama. Yeah, it's making me feel edgy too, hmm? Naruto heard a strange sound and looked up only to be surprised upon seeing a large flaming meteorite fall from the sky crash into the middle of the city. I wonder what that is? I better go and check it out. He leapt off the building and swung in the direction of the crash site with Sigmas flying alongside him for further investigation. Over at Metropolis, Clark Kent was in the bathroom washing his face at the sink. After watching the late news about him as Superman disarming the missiles to the citizens' approval, he went to bed for a restful night when he was assaulted with the grotesque visions once more and was the reason why he went to the bathroom to clear his mind. His thoughts strayed to the new hero whom he had met with Batman and recalled how he too had the same visions and spoke of them as warnings, but can't seem to figure it out though. He also remembered feeling a little ticked when Kara spoke about Zenko as she stuttered in certain parts during their conversation with a flustered look on her face, making him suspect that she must have used her X-ray vision to look through his mask and had intentions to have another talk with the guy. Beep, 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 beep. His super hearing suddenly picked up the sound of beeping which he recognized to be coming from one of his signal watches that he had given to Batman and Zenko. He quickly put on his suit and took to the air tracing the sound to an abandoned Star Labs building. He went inside and looked around as the sound got louder. Then he saw a familiar gloved hand holding the signal watch underneath two fallen metal shelves. Oh no, Batman! He quickly flew over and flung away the shelves to reveal the unconscious Dark Knight before scooping him up in his arms. He was planning to carry him to the hospital when he suddenly noticed something flying by through the window and saw it to be a large flaming meteor as it crashed into the city's park. Superman flew overhead and placed Batman under the care of the medics nearby and went to investigate the meteorite as the firefighters worked on putting out the flames with the SWAT team nearby for any potential threats, and the media had also arrived. To record the whole thing. Look at the size of that thing, said one of the squad members in wonder. Stay back, it's still hot, said another cautiously. Suddenly something burst out from the meteor, revealing to be a white and red leg which came down towards the two squad members and almost crushed them had it not been for Superman's timely intervention. Then two more legs burst out before standing upright to reveal a central bulbous head with a red, supported by them. Incredible. Is it some kind of a machine? Snapper Car asked in wonder. The strange being's eye narrowed before a red laser beam shot out of it and destroyed a nearby police car. That was more than enough to let the people know that it wasn't friendly in the least bit, so Superman flew at it with a fist reared back only to be blasted by a laser beam and sent crashing down to the ground unconscious. The policemen and SWAT squad all opened fire at the hostile organic machine, but to no effect, and had to scramble out of the way. Suddenly, a pair of missiles slammed into the walker, fired from a black jet piloted by a recovered Batman. However, the projectiles had no effect on the walker, and Batman quickly took evasive action from its return fire. What the heck is this thing? Naruto yelled as he swung around to avoid red laser beams being fired at him. When he had arrived at where the meteorite had crashed, the fire department and police were already on the scene. When it burst from inside to reveal something out of a sci-fi movie and started firing laser beams all over the place, destroying buildings, the police's firearms were not even able to dent it, so Naruto swung into action to help out. Some things remain the same no matter where we go, Kurama mused out loud. What do you mean? thought Naruto as Sigmas performed a barrel roll to evade a laser beam aimed at them. Just recalling the number of times that Kanoha was invaded, and you had to defend it every time, and now you're doing it here. I see your point, but less reminiscing and more attacking. Naruto ducked under another laser beam and called out. Circle around it, Sigmas. I'm going to make it kiss the ground. The phoenix screeched in affirmation, then performed a nosedive with increasing speed as it flew in low while darting from left to right to avoid incoming fire. Naruto shot a chakra chain to wrap around one of the legs and proceeded to fly around it several times for the legs to close in together, 
which caused the walker to lose its balance and fall to the ground. Overhead, Naruto leapt off Sigma's back as the purple dragon tattoo glowed and the spear appeared in his hand. Pierced through with the ever-sharp winds by Akko, he reared the spear back as purple wind swirled at the tip before hurling it at the prone walker to pierce through its eye, then flying back into his hand. Well, that takes care of it. Naruto, I'm sensing more of these things making their way here from the atmosphere, said Kurama. More of them? Hang on, you don't think that. Naruto trailed off, not wanting to finish his thought. I'm afraid so. They must have been waiting for this very moment when the planet is vulnerable. Damn it, this must be what the visions were warning us about. I'll need to regroup with Superman and hopefully push these guys back. Until then, I'll have my shadow clones help evacuate the citizens to safety. Naruto crossed the middle and index fingers of each hand to create a mass number of duplicates as they saluted the original before moving in different directions to carry out their assigned mission. Naruto homed in on the Hiroshin Kanai given to Superman and disappeared in a yellow flash, then he appeared in the middle of a street littered with debris and wreckages of vehicles. He looked up to see Superman fly straight at an alien walker near the bridge and punch it consecutively into the side. Then he punched through the eye and was tearing it open when the walker blasted him away into the side of a building with debris falling on top of him. Batman flew overhead in his batplane to fire another pair of missiles at the walker, but to no effect still. Better get in there and help them out. Naruto dashed towards the alien walker while quickly weaving through a set of hand signs rapidly. Water style. Water dragon bullet. He got to the edge of the seaway and leapt high into the air right as a mass column of water shot up and took on the shape of a dragon before landing on its head. The water construct let out a roar and rushed at its target as the walker fired, but it was destroyed. Naruto had jumped off as the blue dragon tattoo on his back glowed before the Okatana materialized in his hands, which he unsheathed with the blade coated in blue flames. Gunshin, deflagrate with the flames of the Dragon King. Naruto raised the katana above his head and brought it down to cleave the alien walker cleanly into two, then Sigmas flew underneath to carry him away. He then heard a cracking sound and turned to see a similar meteorite breaking open for two more alien walkers to appear out of it and started firing at the city like the first one. Man, these things keep on coming, and I don't even want to think about the other countries currently under attack by them. But this is no time for complaining. Naruto got ready to attack once more when his mind was once again assailed by the visions. Oh, come on, not now. Soon they stopped, and he shook his head to clear his thoughts. But what he saw next surprised him. Superman was actually flying away from the battle. Where is he going? Don't look now, but Batman has gone after him said Kurama. Guess we're following after them too. Naruto created another mass number of clones to help out with the evacuation and defense of the citizens in Metropolis before commanding Sigmas to fly after the heroic duo. On an island unknown to all except for the inhabitants, two women dressed in white one-piece garments sat on horses as they stood at the beach and stared into the horizon. These omens don't bode well, mother. Mankind may be facing its darkest hour, said the black-haired woman with worry. Then mankind would have to face it alone said the blonde-haired woman stoically. How can you say that? Whatever happens beyond these shores is not our concern. The blonde steered her horse back to their home. Here, the gods will protect us. The black-haired woman felt unsure. I hope you're right. Back with Naruto, he and Batman tracked Superman down to a snowy mountainous area where there was a military base built into a mountainside. They also saw tipped-over trucks and jeeps and disabled tanks. They landed on the ground and took note of the hole in the wall through which they passed. The duo walked down the hall when Batman took note of a slightly ajar door and approached to open it, only to be stunned upon seeing a large cluster of what appeared to be pods with half-naked people imprisoned inside of them. What the heck happened to them? asked Naruto worried. I found the original trio of scientists we saw before inside pods at the abandoned Star Labs warehouse. I suspect that these invaders were on Earth before this invasion occurred and were responsible for the recent events said Batman. We need to find Superman and see why he came here. We'll free the prisoners once the place is truly safe. Batman nodded in affirmation to the ninja's suggestion. They then heard the sound of loud banging against metal and traced the sound to see Superman punching away at a huge metal door. Batman flung a batarang to hit the wall next to him to catch his attention. Hold it, Superman. Destroying government property isn't your style. What's going on? asked Batman. See for yourself. Superman pulled the steel door out and tossed it aside. They walked through a room laden with computers which seemed to monitor the health of something. Then Superman broke through another door for them to see something rather familiar to Naruto. 
It was a green humanoid alien which was currently shackled up with machinery. It's one of those aliens from the visions, thought Naruto. He must have been the one to send them, said Kurama. What is it? asked Batman. Mankind's only hope, Superman replied. Then he pushed up twin levers to deactivate the shackles and catch the alien when he almost fell. He has been trying to reach me, and possibly Zenko telepathically, but that stasis field interfered. When his message finally broke through, I came to rescue him. What's he doing here? It must have something to do with the invasion, said Naruto. Then the alien looked up to them. You're indeed correct about it. Naruto and Batman were taken by surprise upon hearing the voice of a male in their minds. I came to warn you, but I was captured and imprisoned here. They wouldn't listen. Big surprise. Batman spoke sarcastically. I sense you do not trust me. Perhaps this will help. The alien then transformed into a more human-shaped form while wearing a blue cape with a high collar which has two red straps crossing his chest in an X formation, blue tights with a red belt and yellow buckle, and blue boots. I am John Johns. The alien held his hand out in greeting but Batman didn't budge. Naruto was the one to take his hand and shake. It's nice to meet you. Batman isn't exactly a trusting kind of guy. Tried to interrogate me the first time we met, ignoring the stare at the back of his head while Superman had to agree to the ninja's statement. The trio was making their way out of the base with Superman intending to have them go and meet with the Joint Chiefs to plan a defense against the invaders when they were suddenly flashed with bright lights and they saw the military army with their firearms aimed at them. Stop right there, Superman. You're trespassing in a restricted area. Our orders are to keep that freak in, said the apparent leader. Superman stepped forward to speak with the commander. Wait, I'll vouch for him. You must let us go. I don't think so, the commander said. Superman was about to plead further when Naruto stood next to him and summoned Gunshin to his hand, much to his surprise. Zenko, what are you doing? Facing an imposter. The real commander is stuck inside a pod back in the base said Batman, having seen the original with Naruto. The commander upon this spoke up, which is more of a reason why none of you will be leaving here alive. Then he and the soldiers behind him began to transform into white and black humanoids with three red dots running vertically down one side of their faces. The aliens slowly approached the heroes with their guns aimed at them to fire. All Naruto could think was, Kurama was right. Some things never change no matter where you go. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support, and look forward to seeing you in our next video.